Welcome to Buddha at the Gas Pump. My name is Rick Archer. Buddha at the Gas Pump is an ongoing series of interviews with spiritually awakening people. I've done nearly 300 of them now, and um, if, the, if this is new to you, please go to batgap.com where you'll see them all um, organized and categorized in different ways. Um, and then you'll see a lot of other things which I'll itemize at the end of the interview. But um, if you'd like to support our efforts, this show is made possible by such support. There's a donate button there. My guest today is Shelley Ray. Um, Shelley Ray has led quite an intense life, which has kind of um, turned, taken a very nice turn for the better in, in, the recent, in recent decades, and she'll be going into some details on that. But just to kind of read a little bio over here, uh, she's a, been a Reiki master for 15 years, um, trained to the master level in many other energy modalities, and is certified in numerous body-centered therapies. Her work in this field became full-time in 2000, so 15 years. She was sexually abused as a child, um, and that was followed by 27 years of drug, alcohol abuse, and bouts of depression, which brought her to death's door in 1997. With the help of 12-step recovery and many spiritual paths, in, the, in August of 2008, Shelley Ray awakened. Um, I've read two of her books. Her first one, Suffering, a path, to, a path of Awakening, Dissolving the Pain of Incest, Abuse, Addiction, and Depression. She wrote after uh, the, the book went worldwide and opened a portal to support and guide many people in their awakening process. Her second book, Enlightenment, Tips to Reveal Your Divine Nature, has become a valuable tool to many who are seeking embodied awakening. While supporting others, Shelley Ray's raucous path to awakening allows a non-judgmental, gentle pointing to the truth of who they are from the depths of her own realization. She balances deep compassion with a steady and potent awareness that you are not, in your essential self, the sufferer. Just before the interview, Shelley and I were talking about how it almost seems like, you know, if spiritual teachers hadn't gone through certain things themselves, then they wouldn't really be very effective in helping pe people who had gone through similar things. Uh, they wouldn't be able to relate. So, you know, maybe there's some kind of difficult preparatory phase that some people have to go through in, to prepare for their particular role as a spiritual teacher. Um, Shelley kind of concurred with that. Um, so, the bio I just read, Shelley, obviously, is going to pique people's curiosity. Um, and so let's get into some of the details for them, whatever you feel is germane and, and might be useful for people to hear, especially considering that you know a lot of people do go through some of the tribulations that you went through, um, depression, if nothing else, as well as substance abuse. Um, and it might give some people a lot of hope that you have kind of come through to the other side as nicely as you have. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, well, I'll start with, I was, I was nine years old when the sexual abuse started. The physical abuse began, you know, as far back as I can remember and uh, immediately began self-medicating when I was nine years old. Somehow I discovered huffing gas mm -hmm. and um, moved quickly. You mean gasoline? Gasoline. Mm -hmm. uh. Yeah. Was, don't, I, you know, I don't recall how I discovered this, but I, t I tied a rag around the end of my baton and would dunk it in the gas for mm -hmm. the lawn lawnmower mm -hmm. and I would just breathe it in and, and get high. And, and it would take away the anxiety and the um, just the overwhelmingness of life. At nine years old, I just felt like everything was just too much. And um, it didn't take very long before I found um, alcohol and drugs. By the time I was 10, I was drinking. By the time I was 12, I was smoking pot um, and doing various other things, um, opium and LSD and speed and whatever I could really get my hands on. At the age yes. of 12? At the age of 12. Wow. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, it just, it, it accelerated. And when I was 20, my... I, I'd moved out at that point. I'd been out for years. Um, when I was 20 years old, my father committed suicide. And um, there was something there was something that happened at that point uh, where the this internal rage around and and sadness around never being able to have a relationship with my father. That was like, 
the cutoff point for any hope of anything ever being good with my father. And, and that was when my drug and alcohol abuse accelerated. Mm. So I was 20 years old and I was at that point doing cocaine regularly, drinking on a daily basis. And um, by the time I was 37, um, I, you know, I'd gone through crack cocaine abuse, a couple of years of that, in and out of a couple of detoxes. And um, at 37 years old, I woke up in the hospital, had been there for four days in pro progressive care and had no idea why I was there or how I'd gotten there. Mm. Tell, tell the story of how you got there. Um, I had a suicide attempt and an alcohol blackout. And um, what was kind of amazing was that, you, you know, you were drunk and then you took a whole lot of pills and then you went out in the woods in the, at two in the morning and lay on some abandoned railroad tracks, not to get run over by a train because there wasn't going to be one, but just to die out there. And somebody mm -hmm. actually found you at that hour of the night yeah. in, an, yes. in an abandoned place in the woods. Right. And the most interesting part about that story is I know people at Lions Ambulance Service and I called. Of course, they, they keep track of all of these calls that come in and who finds who and how the paramedics got there. And no one had a trace of, of a trail to follow. So what do you um, mean? So the, the woman that I spoke to, my friend, she didn't she said, we don't know who called. We don't oh, know how somebody how called, the, but you don't know how the paramedics yeah. got there. And, and so it was like, you know, it was like grace. It wasn't my yeah. time to go. Right. And um, I'm sure that uh, in my in my state, uh, I, I probably thought the train track was a good place to end it, not realizing, of course, in that condition that the train hadn't traveled on those tracks in years. <laughs> <laughs> it starved to death before a train came. <laughs> right. Yeah. Huh. Uh, One impression I got about you while reading your books is that you must be a, a very intelligent person because, I mean, you graduated high school in three years or something, even while going through all this stuff. Um, took me four, five years, actually, because <laughs> uh, of dropping out and this and that. But, um, you know, you, you must have... And even later, I mean, you got into corporate life and, and did various things somewhat successfully while still being a raging alcoholic and drug user. So you just must have had a lot of smarts to compensate for the handicaps that you were imposing on yourself. Yeah, I guess. Um, mostly school was just extremely torturously boring. Mm. It, it wasn't stimulating to me at all. And it didn't take much for... Somehow I could... I had this... I'm very visual and I had a way of seeing the work and yeah. feeling the answer come through me. And I could, I could miss four days of school and come in for the final exam and just ace it. Without yeah. A Again, it's a symptom of a pretty smart person. <laughs> and a lot of times smart kids are really bored with school. In fact, I used to have a girlfriend who was a gram, uh, I guess it was grammar school teacher. And she had, there was this real troublemaker of a kid. Nobody could deal with him. And somehow or other she had the insight that, school was too simple for him and that's why he was making so much trouble so they made him skip a grade or two and then he started doing really well and, and settled down right yeah yeah um another um well i don't know how much you want to belabor all the gory details of, of everything you went through i think we've given people an idea and you can obviously go into more more if you want um mm -hmm. because you know it was pretty extreme but if um one, one preconception of mine or assumption that, you know, reading your book helped to shatter is that, you know, I've always kind of thought in the yogic tradition that the, the body is an, an, a, an instrument through which divine consciousness or enlightenment or whatever is lived and that living it is a matter of purifying and fine-tuning the instrument and that if you inflict a lot of damage on it, it might take you a long time to repair that damage and uh, to, you know, have any semblance of, of awakening. Uh, mm -hmm. And you, you're kind of um, an, an exception to that assumption. Mm -hmm. Although you did a lot of spiritual stuff. I mean, once you mm -hmm. sobered up, right, you really went at it. Mm -hmm. I did. Full, full steam ahead. Yeah. I, I began looking, really seeking in 86, and that was well before I got sober. And it was actually before I um, had my two and a half year stint with crack, um, where I spent a lot of time in a crack house. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, as a part time mom, my husband and I were. Uh, separated well that was in the early 90s 1990 we separated but um so at that point i was a part-time mom and 
when the kids were with their dad for a week, I was in the crack house. And I'd pull myself together and, and get home and take care of the kids on transition day when they were coming home. And, and just so people know, a crack house is where you go to take crack, not to recover from it. Right. <laughs> it's not some yeah, kind of a rehab a, thing. Right. I went to a couple of those too. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. So, um, yeah, you know, looking back on it, it's, it's, it's so odd that that was my life. And it was. So 86, I began seeking. And um, when I, you know, when I wound up in the hospital, I still wasn't ready to get sober. I still didn't think that I could live a life without drinking alcohol. Mm. And at that point, I had mm, three years clean and, clean and sober from drugs. But um, the alcohol uh, is what ultimately took me out. So if you were seeking, but uh, and fairly intensively, as I gather, you're into Yogananda's teachings and a bunch of other things. If you were doing those things, and yet at the same time drinking and taking drugs, was there some kind of a war going on in your head, like, you know, guilt tripping yourself, why am I being such a jerk still taking these things and I, I, I must, I want spiritual enlightenment and yet I'm here I am drinking again. Were, were you kind of, was there a good angel, bad angel kind of thing going on or, or inner conflict or did you somehow just blot out the, the, the discrepancy and, and just carry on? Mm -hmm. Well, most, mostly before I got sober, mm -hmm. I just had a lot of anger toward uh, God, mm -hmm. <laughs> God, spirituality, life. And, and I was, I was, it was trying to pull something out of it that would give me just a little bit of hope and, and guide me in another direction. I knew that I didn't like the life that I was living. I didn't like myself. I didn't like many people around me. Um, I, it was difficult being a mother. I loved my kids, but I hated myself because I couldn't be um, what I had in my mind, a good mother. Mm. And um, so when I, so yeah, there was a battle in there, but mostly it was just, um, anger at life itself and, and not having any real, any kind of resolution around, uh, clarity or, or, um, something new coming in. But when I got sober, uh, I got involved in Alcoholics Anonymous. I had tippy toed in and out a couple of times, uh, because of the detoxes that I'd been in. And at that point, uh, I got a sponsor, and um, she became she became my greatest ass kicker, and support and friend, and uh, she pretty much saved my life. And I remember early on, she said, "I don't know uh, what you have for an idea of God, but you need to find something that's going to work for you. Here's what worked for me. And she slapped Neil Donald Walsh's Conversations with God book in my hand and said, read this. And I felt like a fraud. I remember getting into my room and closing the door and hoping no one could see me or hear me and saying my first prayer, kind of talking out loud to life itself. At that point, it was a little hesitant to address God. <laughs> so you and, felt like a fraud just for doing that because of your long-standing hatred toward God and everything, and here you were starting to pray to it, him, her, her. Right, right, and not really believing in it. Yeah. Not knowing what I was talking to or if it was real. It felt, it just felt fake. Mm -hmm. And early on, very early on in sobriety, I had a couple of really magnificent uh, expanded consciousness expanded states of consciousness uh, experiences and and it changed my world it changed the way i communicated with life with god and um i'll, I'll share the first one with you i you know i was desperately seeking my heart was just aching for connection communication something some sort of a sign and i had my face buried in my hands and the comforter and was weeping as i was praying to this god that i didn't really believe in and what happened was a window opened. It was like a portal. And all of a sudden, uh, the comforter was life itself. And uh, I had this knowingness come through me, which had me in a total state of bliss of what it is that we're all doing here and what life actually is and this human uh, condition that we're in. And, and it was magnificent and it was exquisite. And I was just overwhelmed with joy and I couldn't wait 
to write it all down and share it with the world. And then pop, I came out of that, that state and couldn't remember the details of any of it. <laughs> but it was, you know, it was a great sign early on that helped to uh, fuel my, my path into um, you know, seeking. Yeah. Um, have you found in your own experience, both personally and as a spiritual guide to people, that um, very often when you when you do seek with a sincere heart in and in whatever way verbally non-verbally when, when there's that sincere intention it gets re it gets a response fairly fairly quickly yes yes yeah. yeah i've experienced it and people that i work with have experienced it just in you know a simple little pointing and pausing someone that i'm working with mm -hmm. can drop them right into that state and they're like oh, i see it yeah and it's beautiful. Nothing, nothing moves me more than that. Yeah, once the intention is there. Yeah. 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 You mentioned uh, this is, might seem like a minor point to bring up. I mean, so minor, and, and you're mentioning it, that why am I bringing it up? But you mentioned that once or twice an angel has come to you. Um, and do, do you have the sense that, I mean, that, that this was your guardian angel or that somehow you had been looked over your entire life, cared in, in a, you know, parental way by by some higher being or higher intelligence or something and that you were just having a glimpse of that mm -hmm, mm -hmm. um yes his name is al i call him angel al <laughs> yeah, paul simon wrote a song about him yeah. i know and there's a funny story about that that i'll share after i talk a little bit about al uh -huh. <laughs> so angel al what happened was you know was i was i was wanting guidance and again that that deep deep seeking and sincere longing to connect with uh, the forces that are supporting me and, and sh kind of showing me the way in this this blinded state that I felt like I was in here in life, not knowing where to go or how to get there. And so I was sitting in my bed and I was in deep, deep meditation and all the windows and doors were closed. This is back in Massachusetts before I moved to Oregon. And, and all of a sudden I felt this cool breeze coming at me from the right side. Mm. And I opened my eyes and looked over there and standing there at the doorway, um, kind of leaning on the door jam was this seven foot light figure. Wow. And it startled me. And as soon as I went, <gasps> he disappeared. Mm. And I went, wait, no, wait, I'm not scared. Come back. <laughs> because I, I didn't, you know, I didn't sense any um, malintent. Uh, I really, I just was startled. Yeah, sure. to find someone in my room and and it took a little bit of time before I could open communication with Al and um, and it was funny after I got his name through a number of different ways uh, one morning I came out to the kitchen and I heard you know this guidance through me that said turn the radio on now and I went okay and I turned it on and it was the Paul Simon song that came on and I had just been communicating with Al that's and, funny uh, and it that's... just made me laugh right out loud yeah yeah it's very funny <laughs> <laughs> For those who are too young to remember that song, it's called You Can Call Me Al. Look it up on YouTube. It's a great song. It is a great song. <laughs> Lady Smith, Black Mombazo is singing with him. Mm -hmm. It was on the Graceland album. In any case, <laughs> um, so in your book, you know, you, you say that at a certain point you kind of um, had this cognition or realization that uh, the horrific stuff you had gone through in life was almost like a prearranged uh, agreement or something. Um, do you care to comment on that at all? Sure, yes. Well, I was, I was working with a therapist. Um, I'd been working with her at, before I got sober for eight years and then again for an additional four years after I got sober. So into 2001 and probably two years prior to that, she said that we're done, but she was like my, my security blanket and I continued with her for a couple of years. But um, I'm pausing because I'm trying to remember the question. Oh, prearranged agreement. <laughs> prearranged agreement, yes. So she, you know, one of the things that my therapist said to me was, you know, you, you need to find a way to forgive your father. You need to find a way to forgive your father. And I had this idea that forgiving him was going to let him off the hook. Even though he'd been dead for many years, he was still running my life um, because I was so identified with the abuse that um, I couldn't I couldn't move forward without it. It was who I was. And 
So I started asking for the willingness to be willing to forgive in prayer um, and, and meditation. That would be my intention to just drop in and say, okay, I just, I just want the willingness to be willing to forgive. I didn't want him to get out scot-free. It was like he already took his life and now I'm going to say it's, okay, it's all okay. And so it took a little bit of time for that to settle into my being. And then not too long after asking for the willingness to be willing, something happened in a meditation. I popped into, um, I don't know, I want to call it like a transcendental state. I was, I was out of the body um, in a, a realm that I wasn't really familiar with and had this awareness uh, telepathically that, oh, and it was joyful. Oh, my father and I came to this life with this agreement to do this, this dance that we did together for a reason, it had great purpose. And, and I landed back into you know, my body and the meditation was out of that meditative state. And, and there, was, there was a sense of, oh, even though I don't like it, I can't unknow what I just realized. And so it took some time to, to settle in with that. Um, and, and, you know, it wasn't too long after that, maybe a couple of years before I got to a point to really viscerally knowing that there was nothing to forgive, that there's even beyond forgiveness, there's nothing to forgive. <laughs> and, and, you know, I got to another point where there was a realization that, wow, he was the brave one, the brave soul to come and be the despised one. And so it was, you know, it was a magical transition, but it, it, it was, you know, it happened over time and, and baby steps. And I didn't really have a strong guide. I didn't have anyone that was really assisting me in this, except yeah. for uh, the 12 step program that I was attending. Some people might have a problem with that if we universalize it, and so maybe we can't universalize it, or I'd be interested in knowing what you'd have to say, but are, were the Nazis the brave ones? Is, is ISIS the brave one, you know, burning people alive, and Boko Haram the brave ones, you know, kidnapping those girls and selling them into slavery and all? I mean, so many people do horrendous things, uh, mm -hmm. and it, it's really hard to have this totally magnanimous, forgiving attitude toward them and actually see them as... Um, you know, people who have taken on a very tough role to play, and uh, maybe that's a lot more generous than the actual reality of the situation. I mean, isn't there the possibility that there, that evil incarnates in the world and uh, does evil things and eventually faces consequences for those evil things? Mm -hmm. That's that's the belief system of some people. I've I'm no longer of that belief. Mm -hmm. I've had another experience. And, and it happened with my awakening. Mm -hmm. The moment that I landed in August 1st, 2008, there was a complete flash of my entire life before my eyes. And it was like this divine mosaic and every single piece was pristine and perfect and, and exquisite. And, and there was this overwhelming sense of love and joy. And I could see that every single piece had its place and it was all there for my awakening, for my heart expansion and awakening. And so there was no longer, from that moment forward, there was no longer a sense that life makes a mistake, that it's all here for um, humanity's heart opening and expansion and uh, we need the the polarity to come experience uh, as the souls that we are the uh, evolution and expansion that we're that we're, we've come to to experience yeah well, I would agree that life doesn't make a mistake and that in the big picture it's all for the purpose of evolution uh, whatever is happening it's, the evolution is the overarching <clears throat> force that is that is moving us all along but i wouldn't necessarily i'm just kind of playing devil's advocate here i wouldn't mm -hmm. necessarily agree that 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 obviates uh the law of karma you know that that people just kind of do whatever and then get off scot-free and it almost seems that there has to be a 
you know, you, you mentioned polarities, I think, and um, can't, uh, there needs to be a sort of a, a compensation or a rebalancing, as you sow, so shall you reap. Um, so, I don't know, comment on that. Okay, yeah, so I see life as uh, cause and effect. I, I kind of steer away from the word karma because it, there's so many people that have an idea that you're going to get punished for the wrong you've done. Mm -hmm. And for me, it's just cause and effect. As we, as uh, Hitler uh, did his atrocious deeds, uh, there's an effect. And, you know, as he, that's, that's part of his process of expansion and uh, evolving. And it doesn't mean that there's going to be, you know, for his next life, he has to be tortured in order to evolve. But, but that's, that's part of his, uh, his evolutionary process. Mm. And um, so I like to see it as cause and effect. Uh, if, you, if you cut back the hedges, they're going to fill out and grow in a, a fuller way. And that's cause and effect. If, if, you, if you do something atrocious in this life, seemingly atrocious, it's, it's going to be fertilizer for growth in uh, your next form. Hmm. Yeah, well, I don't want to dwell on it too long because it's, yeah. it, it's speculative, you know. I mean, at least for me, it's speculative. It, it, there's things that make philosophical sense, uh, and you can build a whole logic structure around such ideas, and you know, and people yeah. have. Um, but I certainly am not qualified to speak with any authority about how it actually works. Uh. Right. Yeah. And all I can speak of is you know my own experience. So that 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 experience that I had when when I landed um, it was so potent and. Uh, I, again, like the experience of knowing that my father and I came to experience what we experienced for a purpose, uh, I couldn't unknow what I had just seen and realized and saw that, oh, it's all perfect. Yeah. Every single part of uh, this dance that we're doing. And it doesn't mean that we sit back and say, okay, it's all right to maim and, and slaughter and pillage, but we do it from a state of open-hearted awareness and how is life moving me to serve this situation rather than uh, fighting against it and calling it bad or wrong it's it's a you know it comes from a, there's the movement that comes through me now comes in a different way it doesn't come from uh, a belief system right yeah okay well um Let's move in the direction of talking about when you landed, but let's cover some stuff before we get to that. Um, okay. And uh, kind of uh, give us an idea of, uh, you know, a lot of people, they have a profound awakening of some sort. Maybe they've been meditating for 30 years or doing some kind of spiritual practice, and, and they turn around and say, eh, you don't need any of that. You don't need to meditate. Now, I'm kind of, you know, I think there's a correlation between the fact that they've meditated for 30 years and then they had awakening. And it, it can seem once you arrive, you know, like, okay, you become the sun and you realize, oh, I've always been shining even though there have been clouds. It didn't matter whether there were clouds or not. I've always been shining. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, it, it matters to the people, you know, for whom the sun is obscured by clouds whether or not there's wind that's going to blow them away. Mm -hmm. um, so, so what are some of the things that you've gone through as spiritual practices and how do you feel that they have um, added to your toolbox, so to speak, of, you know, what kind of progress did you make with various things toward this awakening? Okay. Well, I, I, I read hundreds, <laughs> hundreds of books. I've listened to hundreds of DVDs. I followed many teachers. Uh, the, the two most uh, profound teachers, I believe, in, in my journey were uh, Yogananda. I followed his self-realization fellowship uh, teachings for seven years, mm -hmm. and and Eckhart Tolle. And you did Eckhart the Kriya Tolle. yoga practices and everything. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, and I actually had a, uh, a teacher in Hampstead, New Hampshire. I used to attend his ashram and go there for mantra. And he taught a Kriya class, Kriya, a Kriya sauna class on Monday nights in my center. And um, you know, I did Kriya theory one, Kriya theory two, all the asanas and followed that path for two years while uh, following Yogananda's uh, teachings. And, and Eckhart Tolle was in my pocket at that time. And then as I moved away from Yogananda, uh, kind of weaned myself from that, Eckhart Tolle was speaking my language. I got him. and. Um, 
so that he was, you know, those were my two uh, longest teachers, but, you know, I, I dabbled in Gangaji and uh, Muji and uh, Krishnamurti and, you know, I had, I had a lot of teachers that I was hoping were going to wave their magic wand and show me the way. Um, so along with all of this, uh, in, um, I think it was March of 98, I received my first Reiki initiation. And that too, I have to give that great credit for, uh, for my, my spiritual practice. I was giving and receiving Reiki on a regular basis. That was, that was like my day job now. Mm -hmm. Um, and that evolved naturally. I was just giving it to family and friends and people from the church. And they said, you should put out a donation box. And I went, Oh, really? Mm -hmm. And, and then people started paying me, and it blossomed from there. But Just in case was, people don't know what Reiki is, why don't you explain it? It's, it's an initiation that you receive from a Reiki master that helps um, attune and align the chakras, and more specifically open up the crown, the heart, and the palm chakras for channeling healing energy. And so when you receive the initiation, is there some kind of transmission of energy or some kind of shakti pot kind of thing that empowers you to i mean not, not only benefits you but then in turn empowers you to apply it to others well my, my first class all i remember is standing there after the initiation with my hands over a student on the table and feeling like my feet were about this far off the ground and tears coming down my face. I was feeling such love and such joy. And I thought, oh, dear God, I finally know what I want to be when I grow up. This is it. This is what I came to do. And um, so I just moved f fast forward uh, as, as quickly as I could with that. Started weaning myself off of the corporate world that I was, I was still part-time plugged into. And January of 2000, I made a commitment that, okay, if this is my path, if this is the life that I'm to have, I'm going to start turning down contract jobs. I'm not going to do any more of this computer work. And we're just going to see uh, if life can take care of me. And inside of just a few months, my practice tripled. That's great. So, and is that mainly how you support yourself now? It is, yes. Yeah. And then in addition to that, you do some spiritual counseling or one-on-one -on -one kind of things and go give satsangs here and there and so on. Right, yeah, satsangs, uh, Skype sessions, uh, workshops, um, and I work with people here in Ashland in person. Mm -hmm. A lot of people in California too. I'll be traveling next month doing some work. Mm, great. Um, so what was the nature of this dropping in, I think is the phrase you used, and um, you know what seemed to um, precipitate it? Okay, well, and I was in a relationship when I moved here. I moved here from the Boston area in December of 2006 to Ashland, Oregon. I, I was called. Um, Ashland literally I called me. And, and that too is another story. Um, yeah, feel free to tell the story. Who okay, we, sure. We have plenty yeah. of time here. <laughs> Okay, great. Well, I had some bricks. I had never heard of Ashton, Oregon. I had some bricks over the head kind of synchronicities. And I mean, it was just like one right after another, Ashland, Oregon. Well, that's strange. You know, who lives in Oregon? I thought it was all rainforest and, you know, making jokes about it. And, and then it became very clear that I was supposed to attend the Psychic, psychic Children's Conference in Ashland, Oregon in, I believe it was 2003. And, and I came here, and as soon as I arrived in town, I had this head-to-toe vibrational experience that whispered, welcome home. Wow. And, and tears, you know, just standing there on the sidewalk, weeping. I was like, okay, for some reason, I'm supposed to live here. And it took me a couple more years before my last child moved out and, um, and closed down my practice and picked up and moved here with my partner. And uh, so he and I settled in, and Ashland is a pretty intense vortex, much like Sedona. The energy here uh, can really shake things up for you. My partner had this idea that everything that was going on for him when we got here was about me. And I kept saying, this isn't about me, this isn't about me. And it didn't take very long before he decided to end the relationship. And, and so as we're going through this process and I felt him pulling away and I was, you know, going through my own inner turmoil around that. And 
And then in April of 2008, I had my first Kundalini awakening. Mm -hmm. And my partner at the time was out doing a house sitting job. So he wasn't home and it was five o'clock in the morning. I got up and just had this white hot fire blowing through me. And I thought, I'm dying. I, I'm dying. And I literally crawled to the bathroom because I felt like I was going to be sick and uh, managed to get up onto the toilet. And, and, and I thought, what? I, I don't even know how to call for help. And um, at that point, the, the fire got so hot, it, it blew open. It felt like a hole in my heart. And then it did the same thing at my third eye. And when it hit my third eye, my body, it was too much for my body. And I, I released both ends and um, th threw up. Uh. Yeah, both ends. <laughs> And yeah, it was just, it was intense. It was powerful and um, bazooka effect. Right. <laughs> yeah, there's one way to clear, clear the pipes. <laughs> and I made it back to bed and I was just lying there vibrating for hours, vibrating like I'd been plugged into 220 volts. I felt like a light body. I, I wasn't really in touch with a physical form at all. Um, I, it, it took days before I could really touch back into my physical, physical being. But one of the things that I noticed almost immediately was that there were a lot of things that used to irritate me and that button was gone. Hmm. And one of the other things that began happening at that point. Yeah. Um... Well, that reminded me of something. You, you know how in waking down, they have what they call the wake down, shake down. We'll talk about waking down probably in the course of this conversation. And yeah. In the TM movement, it was called unstressing. But the basic principle is that we accumulate so much stuff over the course of perhaps lifetimes. And, uh, you know, the more intense the stuff, the more intense the experience when the stuff gets released. And mm -hmm. um, that when there is a significant awakening, that um, if that stuff hasn't been cleared out, and by stuff, I think everybody knows what I mean by stuff, you know, just the impressions from various experiences we've had over the course of our life or lives. And uh, that when that ex when awakening happens, if that stuff hasn't been cleared out kind of gradually and incre incrementally, the, the awakening itself can be a powerful solvent or something for, mm -hmm. you know, clearing it out more quickly. And, you know, the, the stuff, you know, we can really go through a lot of, turmoil and you know in t emotional intensity and fears and all kinds of things so mm -hmm. i mean you had had been through a lot you know far more yeah. than most people so did you go through a phase where you were just you know like wake down shake down big time uh, mm -hmm. i did yeah. yes was that after well, the kundalini awakening or even before yeah that, that was well it was actually after the awakening but what happened was um you know i'd done so many years and and of work, working with teachers and working with uh, different programs and Alcoholics Anonymous and um, just many, many things. So I thought it was pretty clear. Yeah. Um, and, and it was amazing to me how much how much moved with that Kundalini awakening, how much cleared from my field. Yeah. I, I, felt, I felt lighter. I felt um, more here. Uh, like my peripheral vision was just a little bit wider and I was a little bit taller and hmm. Um, and, and what began happening shortly after the first Kundalini awakening was the, uh, I was tuned into it like this witness that would come and go. Mm. And I would notice that I was moving into a pattern with my partner, a little exhibited that we would get caught in. <laughs> and, and it was our challenge. And, um, and I would see myself moving forward but not feeling the attachment or the identification with needing to be right, but kind of following that old pattern anyway to do that dance, to justify, make it all right, be understood. And, um, and this witness part that was clearly like above and to the right of me watching this whole experience mm -hmm. was just lovingly examining, but I was in tune with both of them. And what happened was I would get to a point where I could either put the hat on and do the dance, like get up on stage and, and do the dance, or I would go, oh, isn't that interesting? There's really nothing going on here and I don't need to do this. And I would stop. And my partner would go, what are you smiling at? <laughs> <laughs> I'd say, I don't know. You know, I just, I'm not feeling moved to respond. 
and um, or to react. And, and so what happens soon after that? So sometimes the witness would go away and you'd just be gripped. Sometimes the witness would go away, but I would remember the experience. And so I could bring awareness yeah. to the moment when I was starting to move in that direction, to, you know, to react or defend or respond mm -hmm. in some way that was, that was connected to a pattern and not really connected to an emotion anymore. Mm -hmm. And, but that, that witness state came in and out from, you know, from April until the landing on August 1st. Hmm. And, um, and that seemed to be the, the cementing. It was like it, whew, it landed, it was centered here. Here's where the witness is within, within this body. And I could, shoulder. <laughs> right. I could no longer separate it and, and witness from, from a separate state, you know, it was, it's here. And, but even though it's here rather than being you know, here or something, um, is this, does the same effect apply in which you are not so impulsive? You're, there's a kind of a, a screw, uh, a kind of a, I don't know if I want to use the word detachment, but a scrutiny, a, a discernment, discrimination that um, prevents you from just blindly getting caught up in things. Yeah, it's, it, it's actually, it's, it's a non-identification. It's, it's, it's allow, it's, it's a sense of allowing, allowing, you know, when I'm working with people, I, I call it, you know, the planet, planet Rick and planet Shelley. It's like, oh, that's how it is over there in that atmosphere. I had no idea because it's not like that here. Mm -hmm. And so really, there's just a sense of allowing both to be here. Um, I guess you could call it agreeing to disagree, but without any fireworks around it, any tension or contraction around it. It's just like, oh, that's the way it is over there on your planet. And... That's good. So, it sounds like a, a relinquishment of judgmentalism. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, but what got me there, you know, the, the fire of awakening was, you know, the beginning was the Kundalini awakening in April and then the, the continuation of the separation from my partner. And um, so at one point my, my almost 18 year old cat, died. Um, he, we were going through challenge for almost six months tending to him and and then and he died and it, it shattered my heart. You know, he was like my bud. And two days after my partner sat me down and said, I, I'm ending the relationship. And I had a trip planned to the East Coast for two months. I was going to do this herbal uh, shamanic apprenticeship and had paid for it. And, you know, and I was leaving in a month and, and I you know, it was just like my whole world just popped. I sat there befuddled. I couldn't imagine how anyone could be um, so hurtful. So, you know, I had all of these things going on. And when the postman knows you're going to move, he tries to deliver all your mail. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yep. And so what happened, you know, through uh, some of the work that I've been doing at that point with waking down, uh, I, I no longer... And with the, the depth of uh, the experience that I had with the Kundalini Awakening, I no longer had any more fix-its. I couldn't positive affirm it away. I couldn't, you know, go realign my chakras it away. I couldn't, I couldn't do anything. So what I did was I felt it. I dropped right into the pool of anger, rejection, abandonment, sadness, grief, losing my house, the garden that was producing you know it had all this stuff and I was just feeling it and at one point I was on the floor on my knees and I was just hitting the floor and wailing as all of this was coming up and out of me and something happened it a door opened and I landed in this vast state of bliss while still feeling the pain and I just recall having this oh isn't this interesting? No one ever told me it could feel good while feeling pain, that both could be present. And, and that was, I don't know, that was, uh, I guess, a green light for allowing myself to continue to feel all of the pieces that continued coming up for me as the relationship very, very quickly, you know ended, uh, got my equity out of the house, was packing my bags, was moving, you know, I moved a, a day later, was on an airplane to the East Coast, you know, it all happened inside of about 10 days, it was crazy. <laughs> That's interesting. Um, 
I guess, you know, given the, the way your life had been for so many years, you must have had a kind of fairly ingrained tendency to suppress things, you know, to not feel things. Obviously, obviously that's why you took all the drugs and everything, so, so as to not feel. And even, if, even after you stopped taking the drugs and alcohol, there must have been a lot of stuff that hadn't been felt that was still kind of, you know, kind of mm -hmm. packed down there. Um, yeah. So it's interesting that a, a complete expressive, almost like temper, te spiritual temper tantrum or something, yeah, yeah, precipitated um, or triggered a, a major shift. Yeah, it was a great catharsis. Yes, yeah. and so what happened after that uh, was the awakening. Uh, so August first, mm -hmm. uh, after you know, getting to all the details with my partner and we agreed on money and, and it was all said and done. And again, you know, this big heartbreak and, and just dropping into it and feeling and I was standing in the backyard and and it literally was like something landed in my body. There was if I swear if someone had been standing next to me, they, they might have heard a thud. <laughs> and and it was like boom, all of a sudden I was I was like a newborn. I was touching my skin and my face. I was like, where have I been huh. for the last, at that point it was 48, for the last 48 years, who, who's been here driving this bus? Um, it was like the first time I was here and I was, I was breathing with the earth and the trees around me. And, um, and there was just a sense of whole, wholeness and connection and nothing needed. I was complete. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, not too long after that, maybe a day later, I started going, oh gosh, it always goes away. It always goes away. And I was wondering, is this one going to go away? And, and it went on for almost four months, about three and a half months. I was just in a state of awe and bliss and um, bubbles of laughter over some of the silliest, craziest things. I walked by a pile of wood that said for sale and I burst into tears of laughter. It just seemed so crazy. They're selling wood. Mother Earth gets it for free. You know, it's crazy. <laughs> so I was in a complete state of bliss for four months. And then, you know, what happened was it became really the new normal. I, my system adjusted to that heightened state or frequency. Yeah, I was thinking about that as I was listening to some of your satsang talks and reading your book and all. It's it's interesting how how we acclimate, you know. Um, we're very adaptable, and it's, it's it's almost like a blessing that we do because life would be so intolerable for some people if we didn't. Um, but it's relative to the the level of happiness. I mean, you could take a person who considers himself to be very happy, and if you could somehow impose his state on some other uh, how I want to say this right? If, you know, who, uh, on another person um, who, I, you know, what I'm trying to say? It's like one man's meat is another man's poison. Is like yeah, yeah. Uh, one one person's suffering state could be extremely blissful for another person. It's all right. a matter of what you've acclimated to. Yes, yes. And yeah. one's one person's blissful state could be abject misery to another person who you know, had actually risen to a much higher level of happiness and had acclimated to that. And of course, we, mm -hmm. don't, we don't just switch each other's uh, levels of happiness like that. But the, if we could, theoretically, we would, I think it would illustrate this point. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I rem my daughter actually taught me the greatest lesson in relativity when she was nine years old. Mm -hmm. I remember I, uh, she, was, she was ranting about the difficulty between, you know, switching between two homes and how tough it was and on and on. And I may have just come off of a crack bender at the time and I was not feeling incredibly patient or sympathetic. And uh, I just, I launched at her, you know, you think your life is so difficult, you don't know what difficult is. And that was when I blurted out that my father abused me and sexually abused me and you don't know what it's like. And, and she just stood there like this, <laughs> this, this awakened teacher, you know, I, I will never forget the image in my mind. And when I was done with my rant, she says, well, I don't know what it's like to to live in that sort of environment, but what I do know from my level of pain is that this is difficult, and and you know, and she was like, 
all I know is that, you know, what's hard for me is hard for me. And this is really hard for me. And it was like something clicked, the light went on and I'm like, oh, she's so right. Yeah. That it's all relative. Yeah. You, know, you, can only, you can only have your background of experience to splash it off of. Yeah. And one thing I've found is that, um, you know, it is all relative. But as long as your life seems to be moving in an evolutionary direction, um, there seems to be kind of growing, ever-growing happiness, you know. And, um, and when your life isn't moving in an evolutionary direction, you, you get a few slaps in the face to let you know, and, and it's not so happy, uh, mm -hmm. or it's not so pleasant. Um, and which is not to say that the unpleasant experiences might not also be evolutionary, but it's like nature gives us hints, pointers. Uh -huh. so it's like, okay, yes. you're, you're on track, you're off track. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yes. And that's our, that's our pendulum. You know, we watch it, follow that and, and try and find center. It's like, oh, this isn't the, this isn't the path and you can overcompensate. And, and it's really, it's the, you know, finding, finding our center um, through those experiences. Yeah. Actually, I, that's one of the things I enjoyed about listening to a couple of your satsangs is that discussions you had about, um, kind of being being attuned to you know I, I don't know we want to use the word nature but being being attuned to that intelligence which you know is our our root ultimately and uh, being sensitive to its promptings and kind of having intuitive feelings almost of mm, go this way go this way not that way you know uh, you might want to elaborate on that a little bit because you expressed it very nicely yeah, sure. Well, one of the things that I encourage people to do is to find their yes. Mm. And, um, and, and if there's, I've had a lot of people say, well, what if I'm finding a no? That's probably coming from the, uh, the mental construct or the ego. If it's, if it's, you know, a contraction or if it's, you know, uh, a, a kind of a, uh, a loud no, it's typically coming for some, from something other than that soft, uh, creative impulse that comes through us what i call life's guidance so what happens for me now what is, if you want to do something that you shouldn't do and you're getting a loud no from that which is guiding us i mean doesn't doesn't it also say no sometimes well um for me what i do is if it, if it doesn't feel like a yes i don't move forward i see so so i don't get like a, a no anymore i don't get that contraction of ah don't do it right. what i do is I you don't in take and, it that far Right, right. I just tune in and I see if I, you know, if there's a yes, it's like, yeah, it's not, I'm not feeling a yes to, to do that or to go there or to work with this person. I'm not feeling a yes. And so there's some, there's obviously something else. Life wants, you know, life has something else in store for me. And so I wait for the yeses. Yeah. You mentioned an incident where some friends had been pressuring you to go to a 4th of July parade or something. And you kept saying, I don't feel like doing that. And finally you gave in and went to it. And then after about 15 minutes, you couldn't stand it and wanted to leave. Yeah, yeah, it was overstimulating. And my whole body was vibrating from the people, the noise. I just don't do well in huge crowds and all that stimulation. I'm very yeah. sensitive. And um, I was thinking about that yesterday because our local little natural food store had a sort of a freebie day where there were all, all these samples and free ice cream and everything. We went down there yesterday. It was just mobbed with people consuming sugar and eating free samples. And it was kind of intense, you know. And I was thinking of your story about the, the 4th of July parade. And I, I, was th I thought to ask the question of, you know, do you feel, have you felt that over time you've gotten better able to be in chaotic situations or go to Walmart if you need to or whatever um, because you've gotten more stabilized and integrated? Mm -hmm. I know my ceiling. Mm -hmm. You know, if I, if I agree to go to some sort of a gathering, I know that inside of probably two hours I'm going to be done. Yeah. Um, I just know my limit um, and I don't push that because I want my body to be comfortable and I'm mm -hmm. so tuned into it and I can, I can honor what its needs are. Yeah. Where before I would push myself uh, because I, from the pressures around me, think or, or thoughts that I should stay longer or, you know, right. whatever it was that's coming in from the outside. And when you think about your drug days, I mean, being strung out on crack for four days without sleep, I mean, imagine what your body was on some level, you know, you screaming in, in protest <laughs> yeah, against yeah. what you were doing to it, and yet you were oblivious to that and keep smoking it. Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. just yeah, just about killed me. Yeah. 
and that was my was that my first well no it was actually my second out of body experience um so it was it was you know my last big crack coke bender where i was in the crack house for eight days um family and friends were looking for me um um I had, it was the first time I'd ever been cut off by my drug dealer. <laughs> uh -huh. um, so what happened was I had a crack pipe in my hand and I just, <clears throat> it, was all, it was all done. And I was out of my body and I was looking at this lump in the chair that was totally slumped over and witnessing the uh, my crack dealer and her partner trying to wake me up, trying to shake me out of it and really scared. And, and I was, you know, completely in bliss. And I said, you know, I'm fine, you guys. You know, chill out, man. It's mm. it's so easy. I don't have to be there. And and then I had this moment of like, oh my God, I don't, I can't find my way back into the body. Mm. And now they're really scared. And it seemed like eternity. I was in that timeless space. Um, but eventually, I finally landed back in the body. And uh, they shut me off. You know, I'm like past past the lighter. <laughs> mm, no more and for you. Huh? <laughs> they shut me off. Called a friend to come get. Well. Um, so there's a story before we got to that. They sure. they called a friend who had been looking for me to mm. come get me. And the way they got his number was uh, he actually did like a graveyard etching on my pad. He broke into my home and took my little post-it note and did a little pencil and, and found the last number and called his friend at the phone company. And they gave him uh, the address and so he contacted that woman and said, I know where you live. I'm going to come get her. I know she's there. And so at that point, once they kind of, after everything, the crisis was over, they called him and said, please come get her. She's, she's all done. Wow. And so that was the beginning of the end. That was in uh, 94. That was in the beginning of the end of my drug use. Yeah. And then three years later, the alcohol took me out. Right. The railroad track incident. Right. Yeah. Amazing. Um, okay, we kind of loop back there into, into, your, <laughs> into your shady past, but um, the uh, we'll come back to the landing, you know, phase as you put it. Um, just you, know, you say you're just kind of in bliss for four months, laughing at wood piles, uh, <laughs> um, and then I get the sense. I think you just said it actually that it's not like it went away. It's that you acclimated. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Um, and during that process, too, I was going through uh, a way of landing in the world that hadn't changed, but every, but everything in my way had changed. The way, the way I saw the world changed. Mm. And so everything on the inside and the way I responded to life and the world had changed, but nothing on the outside had changed. And so you know, that was kind of my wake down, shakedown, as waking down calls it, uh, all, all of a sudden, I'm looking at a new relationship, and it wasn't fitting in the old box, I couldn't even find the box. So I didn't know how to be in relationship. And there was a lot of um, messiness around that. And I, I had lost my filter <laughs> to evaluate my words or to pause before I said something. And I was blurting things out, like hanging my dirty laundry, because none of it mattered. I mean, there was um, there was no filter for uh, using discretion for how much to share and how much not to share, and I was just blurting everything. <laughs> was that phrase people use these days? Too much information. <laughs> Too much information. Yeah, I got I got reprimanded a, a number of times that you know, Shelley, you might want to reconsider uh, writing a letter to the community and um, apologizing for what you just blurted. And I'm like, oh really? And I'd have to sit with him. And go, oh, yeah. all right. Well, I can see how that might have hurt some feelings. You mean or... the waking down community? Yes. Yeah. 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 We'll talk about waking down at some point before okay. it's too long, yeah. but. Um... So I, it, you're kind of implying here that you have refound your filters. Some some kind of a, a, a more appropriate behavior has has gotten you know, developed, gotten established. Yes, I mean there's still transparency and vulnerability, and there's also a, a maturing that happens in the awakening process where you learn how to move in the world uh, and hold both. Yeah. That whole thing actually interests me, and that's a good that's a good segue into waking down because, uh, as you'll explain to us, the 
you know, term waking down, you know, people wake up and it kind of has this up and out kind of energy, you know, transcendent, detached, aloof, gone. And, um, and, but then, you know, people discover that, oh, I'm still a human being. I still have a life that I'm trying to live here. And that necessitates a waking down, a kind of an integration of that transcendent consciousness into the nitty gritty of your human life and all, all of its situations, relationships and behaviors and what you say and what you don't say and so on. So well, when it, it would be worth talking about waking down a little bit, but also that principle in general would be mm -hmm. good, good to discuss for a bit. Okay, yes. So in, in September of 2007, I had popped into one meeting uh, in February that same year, and I was like, this, this isn't for me. And, uh, and then again in September, uh, shortly before the meeting I attended in September, I kept hearing this sense or feeling this guidance to go back to waking down, go back to waking down. And I went, oh, I really didn't feel connected there. I don't know who those people are or what they're doing. And, but I, I honor that now. Yeah. And, uh, and I felt really strongly guided. So I went to this meeting and C.C. Lee was uh, the teacher uh, in, uh, in that particular meeting. And she was a visiting teacher. And I was sitting there just listening, listening, listening. And she looked at me and said, and what about you, dear? And the, uh, the intensity of the eye contact and all that I had experienced for, I don't know, the hour prior, there was some energetic thing that was happening to, I guess, a transmission. Something cracked. And um, I felt as if it was the first time anyone had ever really seen me. Hmm. And um, again, there was this, uh, this catharsis that happened. I was just you know, bubbling up with all the stuff that was going on in my life and how difficult it is to be me and, you know, this crazy seeking and I've been searching and, I, you know, there was this internal resistance because I didn't want to go down one more path, but it kept calling me back. And, um, and, and you know, just the, the process once, once I was done speaking after you know, working with Cece a little bit and then getting feedback from the community in the room, I was like, wow, you mean it's really okay to be as messy as, as I am? It's okay to be to feel as crazy as I feel. Um, and and something something began, it's like the pressure was let out of my my field. There was a little more space for me to be here. And and I remember uh, one of the people in the community handed me Samuel Bonder's uh, one of his books and and I cringed. I went, oh, you know, I, I was already at the point where I wanted to have a book burning and DVD burning party. It was like I didn't want to read one more book. Mm. But I went home with it and I devoured it. And I was in, you know, for five years after that. Yeah. I just should mention that I, I interviewed C.C. Lee about a month or two ago. And uh, under the past interviews menu on batgap.com, there's a categorical index where people are all the interviewees are sorted out by various categories. And I believe we have a waking down and mutuality category that lists all the waking down teachers uh, mm -hmm. that, that I've interviewed. But I just want to say that one, one cool thing about waking down, in my experience as an outsider, I've never actually gone to a meeting. Well, I've gone to a couple of things, but never really been involved, is there's this um, really rigorous um, self-scrutinizing ethical um, you know, process that all the leaders of it go through. <laughs> and uh, you know they have they, they really give a lot of thought and attention to uh, not letting anybody on, on any level of the organization uh, get away with the kind of stuff that has in many cases given spiritual teachers a bad name. Yeah. Uh, um, and when I say level, even that is misleading because there, there's not much of a hierarchy. There's a sort of ego, even though there's stages of authorization and and you know maturity that you can go through as a teacher. There's a sort of egalitarian. Uh, we're all in this together kind of attitude that I think there's, uh, there's a system of checks and balances that keeps the group quite healthy. Mm -hmm. Yes, agreed. And that was one of the things that really attracted me, mm -hmm. that there wasn't um, any kind of exclusion for religious beliefs. Whatever you believe, bring it, you know, bring it in. And um, there's no one guru sitting at the top of some pyramid saying, follow me. It, it was let's let's follow each other and keep each other in in check and something could be said in the meeting and it would trigger someone across the room and then phew, the whole group 
would work on it and hold space and reflect and it was really powerful and it was the it was it felt to me at the time like the missing piece for my awakening mm -hmm. all the other paths i had followed might um uh my, I guess my understanding of all the other paths I had followed, I don't want to make uh, a projection here, but the understanding of all the other paths I had followed was that you pop out, you know, the tr you go to the transcendent awakening and, and it's, it's all about shutting down these first three chakras and not going into the body or allowing any of your human messiness. And so when that was allowed, there was a great door that opened and all of a sudden I landed, you know, that was in September of 2007. And by August of 2008, I was here. <laughs> and it's interesting that, you know, many of the teachers who re represent the kind of out, up and out teachings and don't want to deal with the messiness, as you put it, um, end up falling flat on their faces in the messiness. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> because they've, you know, they've repressed it or avoided it or, yeah. you know, and, and so it ends up, you know, going splat. Right, yeah. <laughs> well, I became a mentor in Waking Down for about a year and, and, you know, it got even more challenging. It was just like nothing, there's no room for uh, any kind of um, um, unintegrous behavior you know yeah. so everything everything was uh was scrutinized and, yeah. and it was good it was good it was you know for a year i was a mentor and decided to turn my mentor shingle in because it, it i was already a teacher in my other work and there was there was there was some conflict and, yeah. and it just seemed right for me to move forward in my work and uh yeah. rescind, the, rescind that title it seems to me that if, if the emphasis of a teaching is you are not a person and there's nothing you can do and nowhere to go and, and all that stuff, there's nobody doing anything. I, I mean, it seems to me that that invites um, problems because, you know, you're not only a person, but you still are a person. Uh, yes. <laughs> you know, you're much more than a person, but yeah, you, you still are a person. And if you totally deny your personhood, it's going to catch up with you. I'm, I'm kind of mm -hmm. being a little bit redundant here, but there are teachings who emphasize, which emphasize that so much that it's, it's kind of their main thing. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, one thing that always interests me is the, uh, the continued progression of evolution. Uh, you know, there are, there are some people who might say, well, I'm done or so-and-so is done. And mm -hmm. I don't think there's any such thing as done. And there, there may be milestones and there may be irreversible milestones where you've really gotten established in something and it just doesn't seem that you're regressing you know, back to a, mm -hmm. to a more you know, less evolved state, so to speak. Uh, but, I mean, do you agree with that? Do you, do you kind of I see, do. is there always a next horizon, so to speak? Absolutely, yeah. So I'll tell a funny story. So when I woke up and then really realized that you know I'm here and, and it's not going away. Good yeah. God, thank you. Um, I, I noticed, so I, I was brought to a point in my awakening where life went, tch, tch. you've become identified with the awakened one. <laughs> and, and so there was, uh, I don't know, there was this experience that I had where I could see it and, and it was, it was a new ceiling and in recognition of that and, and, kind of releasing uh, what it is to be awake and uh, that I have arrived, there was a sense of freer than free. There's more, there's more. And as long as we uh, continue to stay open to the possibility of, I don't know what it is, I have no idea what it is or uh, how big it gets, there's always there's always room for expansion and i love those little spurts of growth that i sense where you know it's like oh there's a little more of me online now and whew, that was that was rich <laughs> yeah so i a lot of you hear a lot of teachers say and i think i've heard you say things like um well this is it right here right now this is good enough you know don't be looking for something else um you know just sort of rest in the presence of, of this moment. How do you reconcile that 
with what you just said about, well, there's always something more. There's, there's always something more when you're not looking for it. Mm -hmm. So I wasn't looking for something more in my awakened state. I thought I had arrived and, um, you know, there was just this, uh, this experience that I had, I believe I was just sitting in nature and, um, this realization came to me that, oh, there's, and it, it was actually, it was shortly after my second Kundal Kundalini awakening. So there was, a, there was I an opening. told us about that. Okay, yeah, I've had three, ah. and all three were as intense as the first. Uh, the third and so one was actually two, two the most and three intense. must have been after you landed. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So let's hear about it. Okay. Um, and also, we'll get back to that question I just asked. Okay, great. The re um, reconciliation of being here now, and yet there's more. Right. Okay. So in in June of 2010, I had uh, another Kundalini awakening. So. The second one was uh, from the first one, of course, was from I've already mentioned was from the root and, uh, and it blew out these two places at my heart and my third eye were the most intense um, experiences of the of the fire that came through. So the second one was from the root and it came all the way up and through and exploded out my crown. Mm -hmm. And this one, the fire was so intense. I guess if I were to explain how it felt for me, I, it was about 10 days. I couldn't even walk with shoes on um, because it was too jarring to my body. So it felt like everything on the inside was connected on loose hinges and was raw. Mm. So every movement that I made was like an owie inside. <laughs> <laughs> and so I had to walk gently in bare feet. And um, so, after that Kundalini awakening, again, it was the same, the same sort of experience. There was a, a greater sense of expansion, uh, more um, kind of conditioned beliefs and ideas I noticed had, were, had fallen away. There was a, a, a greater sense of um, a greater sense of non-identification. I guess it, you know, like being in the world but not of it. Mm -hmm. I was here, and and there's nothing here that. Uh, that I need to uh, be free or happy. And so it was shortly after that, that I had the, the awareness. I believe it was shortly after that, that I had this awareness of freer than free. It was like, oh, I was identified with free. And then again, in um, March of 2011, the Fukushima uh, the tsunami mm -hmm. was the night before that happened. I had my own personal tsunami. Yeah. We had actually had a waking down meeting in my home. And by eight o'clock, I was holding my head. I had slid out of my chair and I was on the floor with my hands kind of covering the light. Uh, in the this, meeting. In the meeting. Right. This massive migraine coming on and I don't, I don't get migraines. And, and I told, you know, I said, please, we're going to have to leave this meeting as it is and people were filtering out and um and i always follow and lock the door but i couldn't get up to do that um i crawled from the spot that i was in to my bed and peeled myself out of my clothes and so this kundalini uh, started in the head and i had this massive fire in my brain and i just had the sense of i wonder if i'll ever be able to think again i wonder if i'll ever be able to reason my brain is being fried and, and it moved down through me. And by the, so on day two, so I was in bed now, it was Thursday and I had not moved Thursday afternoon. It hit the cauda equina at the base of my spine and all of those nerves were lit up and I was paralyzed. I couldn't move at that point if I wanted to, I couldn't get out of bed. I couldn't feel from like my chest down and um, I couldn't feel to move it, except that I was feeling excruciating pain in my in my lower back and my thighs. It was just. How long did this go on? Like over over the top hours. hours. I, I, oh, so not yeah. days, but hours. That part of the experience went on for so hours, you, you and then wet the bed or something. You were able to get out eventually. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah. Sometime Thursday afternoon, I was able to uh, get. I was able to move my body. Um, I got up. I called a friend. He wasn't available that day, but he came back the next morning. So it was on Friday morning he came and um, and 
took care of me. Um, one girlfriend came in that evening and just tended to my needs, you know, kind of, I was, my whole body was on fire and, and she was just, you know, gently mopping me off. And she called me up a couple of days later. She's like, I was in bliss for 24 hours after tending to you. Mm-hmm. And then the same happened to the person who came on Friday morning and took care of me. He, you know, made, brought me some soup. Um, he stayed with me for a few days. Um, a few days later, he got me outside, like holding my arm and walking me like a little old lady. I was in my bare feet and just get me outside. Wow. <laughs> so um, that was the big one. And since that one, I have had many, many experiences of the Kundalini moving through me now freely. So it Did seems you feel that quite um, radically transformed after that one? I mean, it seems like was, it was so intense. You must have felt like a new, a new me after, after yes, going through it. There was, there was, there was a greater sense of uh, landing in, I guess, my center, my strength, no longer having uh, any. I guess any fear about uh, how I'm looking or what people think about me or how it needs i mean there was i was already you know free from a lot of that but that just kind of tore down all the walls there was nothing left but uh but this open um, channel for life to move through Mm. without any kind of adjustment here and there with you know with the reasoning of discernment um you know there there was actually kind of a um, I don't know, a meeting the person on their level that wasn't of the mental realm at all. It was just something that, okay, so life is meeting this person here because this is what is going to be most pertinent to where they are in their life. And, and so from that place, it was incredible how I got to, I got to experience the wisdom that was flowing through me as I don't want to say as an outsider, but as um, being blessed by this wisdom that was flowing through me, but not of me. Mm -hmm. I wonder if the intensity of these Kundalini experiences was in any way related to the damage you had done to your nervous system with all the drugs. And, you know, if somebody else might not have experienced these things so intensely. um, But in your case, there's a lot of intense clearing and repair work to be done. Absolutely. Yeah, I believe that that's what it was. Yeah, Mm. that there were, you know, just so many burnt out wires and knotties and meridians that were, you know, completely out of whack that that needed some recalibration. So, so I mean, that kind of um, leads to the question of, you know, what would you say to people who don't know their chakra from their elbow and don't seem to have any kind of kundalini things and they might be feeling like, and eh, nothing ever happens for me. I'm just kind of a, a slug, you know, and look at her. She's having all these profound things. Um, you know, sometimes flashy experiences can evoke envy and in, in sp- mm-hmm. other spiritual seekers who aren't having them. Mm-hmm. Well, I, I, you know, I just, I, I work with that person. I help them look at, you know, their beliefs that it needs to be a certain way or what are they looking for? I mean, it, it's all, it's always organic and, um, uh, specific to the person that I'm working with. I never know what's going to come through or how it's going to serve them. I'm just, I'm open and receive the information that comes through again, that's most pertinent to that person. Yeah. I mean, would you agree that profound awakenings can take place without a lot of intense stuff of, the, of your sure. nature? That you've, so it can be real, real smooth for some people. Yeah, absolutely. I, you know, I sense that, um, that these very difficult, uh, kind of, um, rocky paths to awakening are, we're like pioneers. We're opening the door for a new way to come through that, you know, once we've got so many of these people awake, uh, that, that it doesn't have to be that difficult, that it doesn't have to be that challenging. I've, I've had many, many people that I've worked with that, have awakened and some of them are just like coming from the cheeriest little lives. I mean, there's no, you know, there's really no impetus for, um, you know, popping, 
pushing them to look for something better, except that they have this 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 deep sense that there must be something more. Yeah. Yeah, you probably know the story of the hundredth monkey. Uh huh. Yes, I do. Mm -hmm. Might be worth mentioning in brief. It was an actual. Well, I think it was something that some some um, scientists had actually observed, where uh, on some island, uh, you know, the monkeys were eating these yams, and and some one monkey learned how to wash the yams off or something to get the sand mm -hmm. off them, and and then the other monkeys started watching him do it and learned how to do it also. And when a certain number of monkeys had started doing it, maybe it was maybe a hundred. Um, monkeys on adjacent islands all, all of a sudden started doing it without yeah. any, you know, it didn't have to grow incrementally. It's like monkey consciousness communicated this new right. knowledge. <laughs> right. And so right. I, I kind of think there's something like that's going on with spiritual awakenings. Yes, I agree. Yeah, you don't have to have the sand in your mouth to know to wash the yam now. <laughs> right. Yeah. 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 So that, that point of pioneers is a good one. It's like a lot of ground has been cleared. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, there too, that, that's kind of a metaphor, ground, ground being cleared, but you know, when dirt has been dug up once, it's a lot easier to dig up the second time. And so there have been a lot of people over the last you know, 40, 50 years that have been f forging a, a spiritual path. And it, it seems to me that that path is getting wider and more easily to, easy to travel. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. Mm. Absolutely. So... Uh, where should we go from here in this conversation? What, what would you like to talk about that we haven't touched upon? Yeah, well, I was just wondering that. Let me, um, can we just take a moment to sure. drop in and see mm -hmm. if there's something else that wants to come up and, yeah. and share? I'm waiting for words. I mean, there were there were a couple of things that we were going to come back to, and I don't recall what they were oh, at this point. Well, one of them was the um, the reconciliation. And did any impulse? Did any intuitive impulses come up in that silence? No, nothing okay. really. Um, yeah, that's my I mean, job the... then. <laughs> I have to wield the cattle prod here. Um, <laughs> so did, we were going to talk a little bit more about the reconciliation of this uh, teaching that's quite prevalent of just sort of accepting the moment, being in the moment, settling into the moment, and, uh, you know, not ex looking forward to some glorious future. Uh, reconciliation of that with the fact that the future keeps getting more glorious. I mean, the, or the present keeps getting more glorious as time unfolds, and, and there seems to be a vast range of spiritual evolution that, that one can yet encounter. Um, so they're, they're, to some people's minds, that might seem to be contradictory. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, great. So, um, when I'm working with people and, and they have you know, they have a situation going on, they have something that they're calling uh, a problem, it's, it's where all of the energy is, is being filtered. It's, it's, I call it like an energy leak. All your energy is being siphoned into feeding this, this you know, sort of entity. And the only way that it can become a problem is an idea that it needs to be different. So what I ask people to do is just see if you can reframe it. See if you can sit back and, and, and um, allow this situation to be here without any need for it to be any different, without any idea of its purpose, without any um, thought process around it at all, to just see it. Because, you know, life life really is neutral. It has 
all it says is thank you. Another way for me to express. Oh, thank you. Another way for me to express. Oh, thank you. Another way for me to express. And so here's the situation that all of our, our mental, um, societal, you know, familial uh, conditioning has taught us to label it in, in a certain way. So see if you can move into it as if it's the first time you've ever seen this and not know what it's for and not have any idea of what it means to get rid of it and then I'll be happy or and then I'll wake up. See if it might be, if it's possible, for it to be a piece of the puzzle and, and not knowing, you know, what it's going to open and open you up to for the next for the next step to just be completely with it allow it to be here i already know it's okay for it to be here otherwise it wouldn't be here so let's see if we can just be with it as it is and allow whatever it is that's coming up for you to to come up and sometimes tears arise and sometimes an opening happens and they laugh they're able to see that they were creating this big drama around something that really doesn't mean anything and what happens is just like uh, with awakening that, you know, the, once that pressure valve is open, once the tension is relieved from the situation, the creative impulse, something else can move through in another way and, and guide you to resolve the situation without, um, without, without all the drama, without all that kind of frenetic energy complicating it. I'm not sure if that answered the question. I'm um, not sure if it was a good point. I'm not sure if it did either, but um, let, me, <laughs> let me come back at you with something. So okay. what I understand you two have just said is that um, if we have a sort of a, a non-meddling um, attitude toward the things that come up in our lives, if we don't insist that they, that things happen any particular way, if we recognize that the things that come up, uh, that all is well and wisely put and things come up for a reason, not necessarily an intellectual reason that we could articulate, but that there must be some right. evolutionary purpose to the things mm -hmm. that, that roll along in our lives. Uh, if we can take that perspective, then we, um, we don't interfere with that which is actually driving the dream bus. You know, we allow the driver to do the driving. Remember that Greyhound ad, you know, it's such a pleasure to take the bus and leave the driving to us. Um, <laughs> I don't know if you remember that one, but um, so, you know, we just, um, uh, we allow kind of a, the nature's intelligence to, to run the show if, if we don't keep interfering with it. Is that what you were trying to say? Uh huh. Yes. And what it does is it right sizes that mental construct. The ego is valuable, but it's meant to be as a tool. It's not meant to be the driver. Exactly. So, so once that is right sized and, and, and the passenger seat riding shotgun as our co-pilot rather than the pilot, mm -hmm. um, then life can have its undulations. You know, it can have its natural unfolding. And, and so we, you know, I encourage people to sit down and meditate because they really feel like that's what they want to do in the moment, not because they want to meditate for something. Right. Meditate because it brings you peace, because it brings you joy, because um, because it's what you're feeling moved to do in the moment, not because you want to change something. Yeah. And what happens is things change. Right. Anyway. Anyway, right. And so there's a greater, you know, there's an expansion. There's a greater sense of the you know the one that we are that uh, is always here present in this form that um, there's a deepening with that sense of, of what's really here mm -hmm. the more we can um, quiet that that mental noise so whenever you notice that you know the mind is directing that it's up there telling us to do something or go somewhere or fix something, just say thank you, but I'm going to do something else and, and drop into the body and and just see what see what's here. Mm. And what it does is eventually it just cuts the hard wire and um, and then there's something else that leads the way rather than coming from the mental realm. It comes from knowingness. It comes from a deep place of stillness. Yeah, so one of the things I think I just heard you say is that it's not that we're going to become egoless, but just that the ego will take its proper place in the scheme of things. And 
you know, it won't be trying to run the show uh, right. in, an, in, in a comparatively inept way <laughs> compared yeah. to that which is much more capable of running the show. Yeah, yes. It's, you know, it's artificial intelligence has taken over and this is just, you know, turning it back to where it belongs, um, letting it, it be in the co-pilot seat. Yeah. And so, uh, so, so as I said, that kind of didn't answer my question, but maybe we've kind of covered it, which is just that they're, um, it's, it's like, you know, that song, is this all there, all there is to the circus? Uh, mm -hmm. um, you know, you hear people. Yes, say, I used to sing that, wailing it from the heart, you know, in early sobriety, <laughs> and when I was drinking. <laughs> yeah. Um, so it's like there are certain popular sayings and teachings in the spiritual world that um, you know this is it. You're already enlightened. Um, you know, you you can just uh, accept things as they are. But I think that that kind of bothers some people because they might feel like. You know, it's like, it isn't good enough. I, I don't want yeah. to accept things as they are. It, it, it could be better than this. Yeah. And, yeah. and I think they're right. But at the same time, I think there's a, a need to accept things as they are, yet realizing that they can and will get better. And, and there, so there yeah. seems to be a contradiction in that. Right. Yeah, it creates a rub. You know, it's like, it's, it, you know, it feels similar to the experience that I had of how do I forgive my father? If I forgive him, you know, it's like letting him off the hook. Well, this is like, if I allow what's here to be here, what if it's not good enough? Yeah. <laughs> um, I remember my, my first interview, uh, my first session with Samuel Bonder in Waking Down, and, and he was talking and talking and talking about, you know, blah, 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 blah. And he said, and, uh, about awakening and he said and when you get over the disappointment he's like da, 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 da. Went, wait 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 a minute back up whoa what do you mean when i get over the disappointment and um and he started talking about the ordinariness of awakening and um and that's you know it really is i mean there's nothing but here and and when when all of those ideas that it has to be something else are put in their place, you know, check, thank you, check, thank you. And, and we stop going into that pattern when we stop that, when we break that, that, that go to, um, that there's, there's a, there's something else that can come through. But as long as we're having an idea that this isn't it, it's gotta be something else. Cause I already know who I am. Mm -hmm. It's, you know, once we know there's no room for all knowing this it's a closed door yeah but if yeah. we don't know what's going to happen if we have no idea what it's supposed to look like it's an open door and then all knowing this can come through mm. life can come through and show us and and it's 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 potent all i can say is that yeah it's ordinary and it's all i ever wanted yeah and so i, I suspect you're not disappointed not at all <laughs> <laughs> yeah and when you know when i had Remember, I've told many people this, and you've probably already heard me say it in some of my talks, but boy, uh, when I had my awakening, the mind went still. Mm -hmm. It was like, it literally, you know, like in the, the movie The Matrix, somebody had come and cut the hard wire. Mm -hmm. And if that was all that ever happened in awakening, I would have been, oh, so forever grateful yeah. because it's just, you know, it's like the still lake. You can see the reflection of the clouds, you know, moving on past, but they're not creating a ripple. And, you know, the thoughts just pass on by, but they don't create, a, they don't, they don't have a scent to them. There's no bait. I don't take it anymore. It doesn't, mm. I don't mind the mind. <laughs> yeah. Um, there's a question that came in. Um, Tara from London asks, what advice would you give someone who feels like they have not yet found the work they were born to do? You previously mentioned at one point, I believe doing Reiki, that you knew it was what you were meant to do. Mm -hmm. Well, the work that you're meant to do is the work that you're doing right now. <laughs> what if and you're working in some cubicle and you hate it? Yeah, well, it's it's... It's a stepping stone. There's, you know, there's a deep sense of knowingness, and what gets in the way of moving from that place of knowingness is, you know, a belief. If I quit my job, I won't be able to support my family. If I become the artist that I know that I'm supposed to do, and that feels light, that feels open. 
Um, what if, what if there are a lot of, you know, there's a lot of fear that keeps people stuck in a place that doesn't feel like a fit for them. Just like for myself, you know, with the corporate, the corporate life that I did for 10 years, I hated it. It was so counter to my being. It was destructive. It was not at all um, exciting or stimulating. It just felt, it felt fake. It was, it was of a world that I didn't belong. And I was trying to force myself to fit into um, where I thought, uh, a, you know, a good American woman ought to be and following like the dream, the American dream. And um, it got to a point and well, I already talked about that part of the story. I mean, it just got to a point where I couldn't do it anymore. Drinking was the only thing that allowed me to do it for as many years as I did. But mm. So it's really, you know, checking all of the beliefs. Is it true? Is it true that I have to do this? Otherwise, you know, whatever the, whatever the thought is. Yeah. And well, you know, there's a reason they call them starving artists though. I mean, you know, it might be that you do have a family to support and that you're not going to make a living if you just drop your job and, and go and try to be an artist or something. Uh, so that's the kind of thing. And you, I mean, that's the kind of thing a lot of people deal with. Um, and, I mean, you yourself told the story about how you were selling your possessions in order to pay the rent and, you know, running out of money, running out of money and, and thinking that you should go ahead and get a job. But this little voice kept saying, not yet, wait. just wait. Yeah, wait was the word. It just came through so softly and so clearly. It was just wait, like a loving mother would say to her impatient child, wait. Mm -hmm. And I, I know to listen to that. And, and so every time I, you know, went into fear, like I got to go get a job, my God, you know, I'm not making enough money. And, um, and I would sit and I'd look at the classifieds and I'd go into stillness, this is the job. Wait. I'm like, oh. And, and, you know, and the fear would bubble up and I'd say, yeah, but how much longer? Yeah. <laughs> And, and so, you know, it's really, it's not having a, an idea about what my life needs to look like. Okay, so I surrendered to it. I said, if it means that I'm meant to live under a bridge, you know, because that's where my mind would go. It's like, yeah. worst case scenario, if I don't do something soon, I'm going to be pushing a cart and living under a bridge. <laughs> and, uh, and then I went, okay, well, what is my belief about that that says it's bad? You know, what if... What if being homeless and happy is my next step in this journey? Okay, well, I surrender to whatever it is that life has in store for me. Yeah. I'm clearly hearing uh, another thing coming through me, and it's not go get a job. Yeah, I think maybe I don't know much about birds, but I think some birds have the ability to kind of rearrange the eggs in the nest and yet continue sitting on them. Um, so I think maybe we don't want to give pat answers with this kind of thing but so for maybe for some people you know you don't need to make radical abrupt gut-wrenching changes in your life you know erratic sudden changes uh but you can you can kind of get a momentum going in a certain yes. direction you know yep. while still paying the bills but you get this momentum going and eventually the momentum kind of becomes the the main thing yeah well, that's what I did. You know, I, I continued with my taking contract jobs, of, you know, doing work on my computer the first couple of years of my Reiki practice. Yeah. And what happened was I kind of made a deal with with God. I made a deal with life. I said, OK, I'm feeling strongly guided that I need to drop that world. And it was the cash cow. You know, it was it was what was supporting me. I said, yeah, but I feel this impulse that it's time for me to let go of that and move on with this. And I said, okay, if this is if this is what I'm meant to do, I really need to be shown that I'm gonna be taken care of. Yeah. And as soon as I made that decision, okay, January 1st, 2000, I was being flooded with phone calls. Hmm. Yeah. It, no, flooded with phone calls for contract work oh, with the computer. Oh. Yeah, and it was almost like the universe saying, how serious are you? Yeah. <laughs> are you really committed to this agreement that you've just made? And I just kept saying, um, no, thank you. I'm not taking any more work and um, referring referring the work out to one of my colleagues. Mm -hmm. And uh, and again, you know, inside just a few months, my, my practice tripled and um, and then it began expanding. Mm -hmm. I moved into other energy modalities and body work and nutritional guidance. And, and of course, all of that shifted when I moved here to Oregon uh, and, and got to sit 
in Ashland for almost four years wondering uh, what's next. Yeah. I'm reminded of a couple of things from the Bible, you know, there's that seek ye first the kingdom of heaven and all else will be added unto thee. There's that. Mm -hmm. And I think there's also some verse which is something like the, the father knows what the son needs even before the son knows it. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know what that, where that's from, but I think it's some, from the Bible someplace. So it's sort of like, you know, it's not like you can do whatever the heck you please and everything's just going to be taken care of for you. There is that element of seek ye first the kingdom of heaven. And which you were doing. I mean, you're on this spiritual quest, and you know that was that was your main priority. Um, and yet, you know, in retrospect, you can probably see that there was a, a kind of a you were taken care of in in ways that you might not have even foreseen, um, mm -hmm. and and that kind of accrued from your focus on f finding your deeper truth. Yes. Um, yes. Yeah. Yeah. And it was, you know, it was really, it was just teasing out the, uh, um, you know, the entanglement of all of my beliefs and by showing me over and over and over in many different ways that you're taken care of, you're taken care of. Look at the mess of the life that I came from wanting to, you know, as a child kill either my father or myself. I have no idea how that didn't happen. Yeah. And um, and taken care of, taken care of. I tell a funny story at this point. It's going to be a good place to plug something in. I was sitting um, after my Reiki two class, where I was working, con you know, consciously with the, the symbols that they teach in Reiki two. Um, I was holding a picture of nine year old Shelley, and had been doing a lot of uh, kind of distant Reiki on nine year old wow. Shelley, and. So sending her lots and lots and lots of Reiki and just blessing her and holding her and blessing her and holding her. And again, I popped into that kind of that that trance, that space where, you know, I wasn't really aware of anything but that. And remember, as a nine year old, having this sense of, um, you know, really just wanting to wanting to figure and many, many ways and thoughts of how I was going to kill him and many, many ways and thoughts of how I was going to kill myself. And, and every time I would get to a point of making a plan to do it, I couldn't go through with it. There was something, there was something holding me, you know, there was something holding me and protecting me from, from making a movement in that way. And all of a sudden I popped back into, you know, this awareness, dropped the picture and I went, oh my God, it was me. Wow. It was, it was me that was holding her. That's and so really it was cool. my... <laughs> it was my first sense of this uh, uh, this sense that I've experienced many times now of infinite parallel realities. They're yeah. all here at the same time. There is no time. And that that nine-year-old Shelley is right here. And I'm here, too, supporting her from another another uh, parallel reality. And um, cool. so it was it was wild and, and a little bit spooky. I went, oh, that rabbit hole is a little bit too deep to go down, you know, by myself. <laughs> you want to get really rich? Make a movie of your life. <laughs> have it be this sort of like personal sci-fi kind of thing, you know, with spiritual right. elements and all the all the difficult stuff and the the fifty something year old Shelley attending to the nine year old Shelley and you Right. Know. <laughs> yeah. It could be a fun one. Yeah. Yeah. Fun and messy and, and and really inspiring too. So it could be an interesting movie. You you yeah. can get Gwyneth Paltrow to play the adult Shelley. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> I'm reminded of that movie Sliding Doors. Remember, did you see Sliding Doors? Yes, I did. Yeah, it was great. It was yeah. cool. It was like two alternate realities that went off in different directions according to whether she got on the subway or not. Right, right. Yeah. yeah. Well, I've had that experience actually um, with uh, the out of body experiences that I've had um, somewhat. So, is this a good place to sure, anytime. El elaborate a yeah, little yeah, bit yeah, anytime. how much time we have left Don't here? Worry about but it. Um, so in 1983, um, when I had this car accident, I was a passenger in the back seat oh, of a yeah, car. Oh, yeah, I haven't even talked about your car accident. Yeah, so it's like yeah. a whole, whole nother chapter. <laughs> it is, yeah. <laughs> so um, it was my first night out after my daughter was born. She was three months old and was at home with the nanny. And um, so I was out drinking with my friends. And uh, the person that was driving the car was showing off to his friend the um, you know the power of his brand new cougar and I was in the back seat none of us had seat belts on we just come from a club and and he went to pass someone he, he was doing over 100 miles an hour and the car two cars in the right hand lane one pulled out to pass the car in front of him not realizing he had a rocket coming up behind him yeah. and so Nick locked up his brakes and it put us into 
you know, we're doing 360s and it threw us into the median and we hit the a tree rear end first, which mm. catapulted me through the rear window. Mm. And I went flying through the trees and my clothes were all shredded off and one of my shoes was ripped, you know, the leather strap was the only thing that was left around my ankle and clump, you know, there was this lump of body on the ground. Like and 50 feet from the car, right? 50 feet from the car, yeah. yeah. And so, you know, I'm, I'm above my body and looking and and I can hear people yelling for me and and then the police arrived and then my sister arrived she'd come from the club and she saw a flash of the cougar emblem that the cougar on the uh, the hood of the car in the woods and she went that's my sister and screamed at this guy to stop and so she arrived and and they found me but the whole time everybody was yelling I was saying I'm over here I'm fine really I'm fine okay but my mouth you know nothing was happening I was looking at her going she doesn't look very good you know <laughs> all bloody and half naked and um, you know bleeding in a lot of places and um, so I had this sense uh, really long after that that uh, that what happened was there was there was a reality that went on from that position, from that place. And then I woke up because there was a gap, you know, and, and it wasn't clear at that time. It was, it was clear after when I began meditating, even when I began meditating while I was still drinking, there was an awareness that happened around this incident, that there was a reality that continued, that that body didn't get up and get recovered. Um, that reality went on with, you know, my three month old daughter living without, a mother in that dimension, in ah, that parallel reality. And then I woke up because we don't die. It's like, I wasn't done. I woke up, I'm in the hospital and I've got, you know, stitches and all this stuff around me. And, um, and so, you know, slipped into another par parallel reality to continue my quest, huh. um, to continue my, my search uh, for what it is that's, that's here, you know, for the one. Interesting. So the sliding doors mentioned kind of, you know, triggered this this memory of this conversation. So what you're saying is that there was there was the potential for dying at that point, but somehow some other destiny clicked in. And so you took, you know, this course instead of this course. Right. Right. Because so you, you had some destiny to fulfill. Right. And so I don't have this sense of, you know, going sliding doors, going back and, and uh tending to the trauma of uh, that lifetime with my my daughter being you know growing up without a mother but i do use um, pictures of my children when they were younger to help heal the wounds of uh you know the trauma of growing up with an alcoholic mother yeah. and and i have this sense too that it's it's creating a ripple effect of all of the parallel realities that we've come and and we're doing this dance in yeah. it's why not? I mean, time is really very relative. Um, did you know that, uh, you know, if you look at like the Hubble Deep Space Field, for instance, and you see the light from galaxies that are 13 billion light years away, um, it, take, it took 13 billion years for those photons to reach us. But if you were riding on one of those photons, if you were one of those photons, um, space collapses to zero and you are here instantly. Yes. So, yes. so time and space are very malleable. And, mm -hmm. and why not? look at a picture of your your child from 20 years ago and actually have an influence on the course of their life right right yeah so um have you read my recent parallel realities awakening tips i, I read both of those two books the, the enlightenment awakening tips and uh, one about suffering and oh, okay you know, kind of a biographical thing those are the two things i think i read yeah i was actually re um mentioning my uh, the awakening tips it's a monthly newsletter that no, i, I send out that. No. okay yeah no. so um I'll, sh I'll share another fun story so yeah uh, i titled this one uh, parallel realities because it was my first experience of something really solid happening that was um you know miraculous mm -hmm. so the day before I, I just got back a couple of weeks ago from a trip on the east coast working seeing my kids and my grandkids and my family from florida to new hampshire and um, the day before I got on the plane, I came down with a whopper of a cold. Mm. And, um, and I thought, oh, well, let's see how this is on the airplane. You know, my ears all plugged up. And so I got on the plane and, you know, it was challenging, but I was just with it. You know, I don't have a story about things anymore. I was just with it, with every tissue, with every blow. 
and I changed flights in New York and was pulling all these tissues out of my pockets and out of my wallet where I tucked many things and, and threw all the tissues away. And when I arrived in Florida, I went, oh no, I, my, I, had two, I only brought two pair of earrings for the trip. Two earrings. Um, my, my favorite earrings, I had one pair on my ears and the other pair were wrapped up in a tissue mm. and tucked in a particular pocket in my wallet, but there was a corner of it sticking out. And so I threw everything away, I threw my earrings away. So there I was in Florida and sharing with my, the story with my mother and, and we went out, we had our bags sitting next to my water jug and it leaked and everything got wet and, and so everything was emptied from our wallets and our bags and there were no earrings, you know, I threw them away. It was very clear. There's no pocket or flap in my zipper pocket where the earrings were that they could have hidden. And so what happened was I was working with a client and reminding him of the infinite parallel realities and of our infinite nature. We're having this very deep talk. And after I got off the Skype session with him, I went, oh, well, look where my energy is going. I'm just, I was so focused on, oh, I've thrown a pair of earrings that meant a lot to me. They were a gift from a dear woman. And that's where my energy was, that they're gone. And I went, oh yeah, we can play in consciousness. Um, all realities exist here and now. So there is a reality where my earrings are still here with me. Mm -hmm. I'm just not tuned into it yet. So what I did was I, you know, I put awareness on the, the enthusiasm, the excitement that I felt about having my earrings back in my possession, having them arrive in my wallet and not needing to know how they got there. And so many times on my trip, I'd been in and out of that zipper pocket. There were only two things in there, my license, my credit card, and well, three things and a safety pin. My earrings were gone. And so I stopped into a restaurant and reached in there for my credit card. And there they were, my earrings just lying there. And I went, nice. That was so fun. Yeah, I <laughs> so, did. It. So it was, a, it was a great experience. So what happened was my flight home. Um, so I hold that as a pearl, you know, as a, as a great pearl in my awareness for every time, you know, to, to uh, pull back and realize where my energy is going uh, when something kind of challenging happens in the moment. So my flight home, um, it's long, I've been gone for a month, I wanted to get home and um, I arrived at the airport in Minneapolis for one of my connection flights and my flight to LA was uh, delayed an hour and a half and I went, oh, there I am. I'm like, I'm gonna miss my connection to Medford. I'm not gonna get home tonight. And then I went, oh yeah, the earrings. And I pulled myself back to center and I looked at her and I said, oh, please look again, there must be another choice. And she's like, I'm sorry, there's nothing we can do for you. And I said, oh, please look again. There must be another choice. And I just kept seeing the excitement of me arriving in Medford and my friend arriving with my juice drink for me. And um, so what happened was she went, you know, her eyebrows went up and she went, wait a minute. She got on the phone and it took about 10 minutes and she got off the phone. She said, this woman I was just speaking to, she said, we are not allowed to do this. This woman is traveling on miles and, um, another airline and but I feel like I'm supposed to do this for you <laughs> and she said we've got a flight home for you and you're going to go through uh Salt Lake City and we're going to get you to Medford and you're going to get home 10 minutes earlier <laughs> and uh and it was so funny I just looked at her name tag and her name was Grace oh I went, nice I said you really are Grace thank you <laughs> so uh yeah so we can play you know we can really play in consciousness and we get to a point where you notice where your energy is going and you can you know take one conscious breath and drop back into center and, and see what it is that you know that again that cause and effect yeah. here's the cause and you know the next moment is going to be the effect and what am i creating right now that's a great story and um i think the thing to point out in it is that um you know there's the secret and that, that kind of thing um you don't just put post-it notes on your refrigerator wishing for this, that, and the other thing. There, there, there has to be the component of, you know, deserving than desiring. Um, you know, creating the sort of deeper reality in your life that, that allows these synchronistic events to take place more readily. Um, there's a, a quote from the Smriti, which is a Vedic scripture, which says, The action of great men gains success through sattva purity of consciousness and not from the means of action. 
Um, so it's sort of like, again, it's like, seek ye first the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven and all else should be added unto thee. I think it's important to throw that in there because people start yeah. listening to these things like the secret and they, they feel like all you really need to do is have the desire. But that's like trying to shoot an arrow without pulling it back on the bow first. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's really, it's, you know, for me, it's, it's about love. It's, it's that energetic of love and enthusiasm. I tell people, you know, bring on the fuzzy bunny face if that's what it takes <laughs> to get that warm spot in your heart yeah. and, and have the intention. And, but the, you know, part of the most important part of it is to let go, you know, to let go. You can't hold on to it and keep mm -hmm. saying, I want, I want, I want. Right. It's just love it, go into gratitude for it. Know that life can't say, you know, life cannot not hear that. Yeah. It's like and, a, life might say, if, if we anthropomorphize life or, or if we want to think of God, it's like, all right, already, I heard you. you know, shut up and let me do it. <laughs> right, right. Get out of the way. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, that's great. Any other stories you'd like to tell us? Oh, well, I'll tell another funny one about uh, Angel Al. I haven't oh, yeah. talked much, much about him, but... Uh, again, in early sobriety, he was, he, he saved my life early on uh, because in really uh, my first year of sobriety, I still wasn't sure that I wasn't going to end my life. And um, so, you know, this angel came in and I was <laughs> struggling with money and trying to get my footing back. And, you know, I've got 27 years of of, of feelings coming up. My my life was, was a mess. All these things that I had numbed uh, and, and repressed with drugs and alcohol uh, were now coming up to be felt um, big time. And um, so my life was crisis. It was, it was, you know, grabbing the fire extinguisher and just putting out one fire after another. And I remember one day uh, just standing in the grocery store struggling with all the things that I needed to buy and the little bit of money that I had in my hands to buy it with, going, you know, really angry at life. And, and shouting out internally to Angel Al, it's just like, you know, I'm not asking for a lot, just a hundred grand would be nice. <laughs> and the moment I had that thought, the woman in front of me bumped into the candy bar, uh, the candy uh -huh. dis uh, rack uh -huh. and a hundred grand bar fell off and I caught it. Oh, and I looked so at funny. it, I looked at it and I went, oh, that's funny, Al. <laughs> <laughs> that's hilarious. Uh, he really does have a great sense of humor and, um, and there were many, many things that made me laugh right out loud. Uh, it's, you know, through difficult times, too. So, yeah. um, and again, I was always taken care of. None of us ever went, uh, you know, hungry. We might have had peanut butter and jelly as a staple for a while. But, or 100 grand bars. Or 100,000 <laughs> dollar bars. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's he, great. He gave me a winning number once in a dream, too. Did you use it? It, it won? I did. It gave, you know, there's... <laughs> Here's how limiting um, the mind can be. So again, you know, with that frustration of life is against me and I'm a victim and I was really entrenched in that for a long time. It's like, uh, you know, a hundred dollars, that's not a lot. That's all I need is a hundred dollars really to, to make the rent this month. And, um, and I had a dream and my daughter came through and, and she was, the number was 911. It was like an emergency. And then this number after it, and I had no idea what that number was. And it was like weird. And, um, and the next morning I got up and Al, uh, through one of his signals, said, remember the dream. And, uh, and I went, oh, yeah, and I wrote the number down. And when I went to the store to pick up a couple items for the house, uh, they have this little lottery booth. And I went through and I played the number and I won exactly $100. Oh, that is pretty cool. So it was just enough yeah. to make the rent. Uh, you know, I could have asked for more, I guess. But, you know, in the dream, that was what I was you know, what I was given because that was what I asked for. Yeah. And it's what you really needed. It was what I really needed. Yeah, for a million dollars, it probably would have been a little exorbitant for that. I wasn't ready for that. Yeah. You know, really, I wouldn't have been able to, I wouldn't have known what to do with it. <laughs> you would have gone out and bought drugs with it. Right. I wasn't growing up enough to handle that much. <laughs> yeah. Interesting. Well, there's kind of an overarching uh, principle involved in, I mean, in all these stories, which is that um, you know we live in a conscious universe you know it's not it's not mechanistic it's yeah. it's sentient in some deep way mm -hmm. and um, it's you know I mean I, I think you can't really um, compartmentalize or separate 
whatever we are from whatever it is in the larger sense, although on the surface level you can, but more deeply, it's all one yeah. ocean of consciousness, you know, interacting with itself. And, and all sorts of mir miracles are possible, aren't they, when, when we kind of like learn to function on, on that, that kind of more unified level of, of being, of yes. reality. Yeah. 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 Which is heartening, I think. Even if people aren't experiencing that, I think most people intuitively know that that's the way it is. And um, there's some kind of, when people hear, hear words like this, they think, yeah, you know, I know that. Um, and it's just kind of a matter of living it more and more fully to really yeah. gain what we might call the practical significance of it, or the practical advantage of it. Right, yeah. And there has to be a willingness of letting go. There's got to be a willingness of letting go of the story that one is so, so identified with. Mm -hmm. That, you know, if they're really attached to something and believing it, there's, there's got to be a willingness of letting go of that and seeing, you know, seeing it as something before them that they have no idea what its purpose is. And again, it's just, it's opening the pressure valve and letting, letting everything out of it creating more space for something new to come through. And I think I remember Eckhart Tolle saying once um, that mud isn't, you know, like if you get stuck in mud, you can put all of your focus on your feet that are stuck in mud and call it bad. And what am I going to do? But, you know, mud isn't bad. It's just mud. <laughs> and if you allow mud to be mud, you might be able to lift your head up and and look around and, and find a branch, yeah, yeah. Or, or somebody standing close by and ask for you know ask for some help. That mm -hmm. that there are other options, but as soon as we're identified with mud and stuck, that's where we are. Yeah. Well, there's that bumper sticker, you know, let go and let God. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. True. Yes, it is what we are. Yeah. Yeah, that's a nice note to end on. Is that's what we are. Yeah. Um, and there's all these Vedic sayings, you know, top twamasi, that thou art. Yes. I have a song that just came through me recently that I sing at one of my events. And uh, it's, the title of it is We Are God. And, mm -hmm. and it goes through all of these things. You are, they are, we are God. I am, you are, they are God. And it ends with uh, he is, she is, we is God. Yeah. <laughs> And the first time I sang it, I saw one person perk his ears up and he went, wait a minute, that's bad English. And I went, okay, sing it again and see if it's true. <laughs> <laughs> and he went, oh yeah, we is God. Hmm. So it is singular. Nice. Do you accompany yourself on a guitar or something? Or are you singing a cappella? Ukulele. ukulele. I do sing a cappella. I do sing a cappella too, but yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm playing a ukulele. Feel like singing it, or you want to just put it on YouTube and people can watch it. We'll later. put it on. <laughs> we'll put it on YouTube and people can watch it later. Okay. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. Great. Um, all righty. Well, um, any closing thoughts? I think that's a, that sounds like a good place to end. Really, that we are it. There's nothing else but this. And when we can open to that which we are, um, there's something new that comes through, and it's mind blowing, which is what's needed. Mm. <laughs> Yeah, mind needs to be blown, and once that's shattered, we can we can see really the uh, infinite, infinite source of life that we are. It's joyous and challenging and magical and muddy and really wonderful. Beautiful. Well, thanks, Shelley. Yeah, thank you, Rick. Yeah. Really appreciate uh, appreciate being on the call and uh, really appreciate the work that you're doing. Yeah, I love doing it. Um, so let me make my usual little closing remarks. Um, okay. I've been speaking with Shelley Ray, and this is part of an ongoing series. You probably know that by now. Go to batgap.com, look, look at the past interviews menu, and you'll see all them all organized in different ways. There's a place to sign up for an audio podcast, which we're having difficulty with uh, lately, but it's still working for some people, and we're going to get it totally fixed for everyone soon. Uh, there is a uh, place to sign up to be notified by email each time a new interview is posted. There's the donate button, which I mentioned earlier, um, and a bunch of other things. If you just play around with the menus a bit, you'll see some little interesting tidbits. Um, so, and also, as you may be aware, this, these interviews are live streamed these days, so if you want to watch live and send in a question while, while I'm doing it, you can do that. 
So thanks for listening or watching. Uh, next week I'll be speaking with someone who uh, I'm very excited about, a gentleman named um, Reverend Michael Dowd, who has made a YouTube series called God in Big History, which you might want to even watch before the interview, and who, along with his wife Connie Barlow, has been traveling the United States pretty much full time for 10 years giving talks about um, sort of reality-based religion. In other words, that um, religion dooms itself to irrelevance and we as a society doom ourselves to a rather hellish future if we uh, deny certain realities um, which and there are all sorts of implications for climate change and all kinds of stuff but we'll we'll talk about that all next week <laughs> so uh, and he expresses it much more articulately than i do so again thanks for listening or watching and we'll see you next week <laughs>